the more I see of Australia, the more fascinated I become by this vast continent. In this series, I'm going to look at stories of people, places and events as I travel in the traditional Aboriginal style by going walkabout. This is the Stuart Highway. It runs almost 3,000 kilometres from Darwin in the north of Australia to Port Augusta in the south, dissecting the very heart of this vast land. It takes its name from a little-known explorer who was the first European to successfully cross the continent in 1862. Well, I know this series is all about walking, but uh, the story I want to look at on this particular episode requires a lot of driving because I want to look at one of the greats of Australian exploration. The first man who walked from south to north and back again, a man called John McDool Stewart. But it's not his big expedition I want to look at, it's the little ones that led up to it. The little expeditions that taught him how to conquer this country in terms of finding water and finding his way and being alive here. Very little was known then about the interior of the country. No maps existed. It is said that the early European settlers knew more about the surface of the moon than the interior of Australia. There's no doubt that Australia is vast and arid. But you know, when you travel in air-conditioned luxury on tarmac roads, you're lulled into a false sense of security. It's only when you come off of the hard top that you begin to realize that yes, you are traveling across a desert and it still has teeth. Stuart felt the bite of those teeth many times on his explorations, almost costing him his life. One of six children born in the small village of Dysart, Scotland, he came to Australia in 1839 and worked out of Adelaide as a surveyor. He thrived in the desert, the quiet and the desolation appealing to his nature as a loner. He became obsessed in his desire to map out the centre of this uncharted territory, pushing himself and his men to the very limits of endurance. During these early expeditions, he developed his own approach to conquering this land, and one that in my mind made him one of the greatest explorers of this arid terrain. It's really good to be back in the bush, and I'm looking forward to the first night's camp as we've chosen a very special place, Gregory Creek. This is one of the campsites that Stuart stayed in on his early journeys, and it starts to give me a sense of the terrain he was working in. He was employed here as a surveyor, looking for valuable grazing lands copper and gold deposits. It was these years spent in the bush that taught him how to survive and travel out here. As the crew set up for the night, my first priority, like Stuart, is to brew some billy tea. There are a few things that uh, you can take with you in desert trips that can be very useful, particularly here in Australia. One of those is a head net. The flies can be very irritating. And having a net that you can throw over your hat, well, you may look ridiculous, but I have to tell you, it's brilliant because you can now concentrate. And uh, in fact, it was a major problem for some of the expeditions with the flies. And the flies constantly harassing the men used to get into their eyes and eventually cause serious infections. So having some means to protect yourself is a very good idea. The other thing that's good to take with you is one of these, which is a solar fire starter. It's a parabolic mirror. What I've got here is a little bit of dung pop that onto the spikes at the end of this. Find the sun. And now this, like a, a little bit like a magnifying glass, but just using a, a mirror instead of a lens, I can focus the power of the sun on the dung. And you can see immediately it starts to catch. 
once that's going I can take it off and it'll glow like a like a little ember and I can use that for starting the fire. In all my travels across Australia I found that the fibrous texture of kangaroo dung is particularly good for lighting fires. Once lit it will smolder away quite happily. Rick Moore, the president of the McDool Stewart Society, joins me around the campfire. I wonder about his motivation. I mean, when you leave civilization, you head into this country, you gradually lose more and more resources until you come to this landscape, which looks like Mars. I mean, I think NASA even sent some, some vehicles here for testing it so like it. I mean, what encouraged him to keep pressing on into such a barren environment? He must have had a bit of a, a burning personal goal. Uh, he was good at surveying, and perhaps being inclined to like the bush, he might have by then worked out he was perhaps better in the bush than in the city. One of the things I find intriguing is the way his expeditions were backed. He, he was working for somebody else yeah. who seemed to have taken most of the benefits of his work. Yeah, his first backer was a gentleman named Fink, and then two brothers joined him. And the Chambers brothers and these guys were leading entrepreneurs. They were into mining, pastoralism, and they befriended him and they took him under his wing, but he worked for them for years. So the treasures are the knowledge, the judgment of the land, the maps, the waters. Can anyone else go there? Very valuable for a new colony. Do you know whether he had any real pals, friends, people who, who weren't just interested in him in some sort of financial way? There's no record of that. He's quite a lonely character, isn't he? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, probably a pretty tough guy to be around, only a little bloke, but tough, but all his men respected him. It was a very difficult thing to keep pushing his men into this incredibly tough environment. I think they, they all went way beyond the call and the physical hardship they endured. Way beyond the call and that goes back to your question, you know, why did he do it? What was in it for him? Yeah, way beyond the call of most men and he was successful. This is a real privilege. On the table here I've got some of the items that are held in collections here in Australia from Stuart's expeditions and it's fascinating to have a look at them. One of Stuart's men was a man called Keckwick and this was his mug. When I travel I have one mug I take everywhere with me and I'm sure it was the same for him. It becomes a very personal item, it's something you use every day. And That mug would have been designed, if I'm very very careful, that folds in and that was designed to fit inside a billy can for cooking. Amazing. But perhaps most interesting of these personal items is this scarf ring made of red coral. That was John McDool Stewart's and it's in the shape of a dragon. I wonder what Aboriginal people thought of when they saw that. And this is John McDool Stewart's belt. This tells us a lot about the man. He was very slim and, um, I mean, I could, I could barely get that around my thigh. I mean, it's quite astonishing, fascinating. Navigation was, of course, critical on these expeditions and it's interesting to note the quality of his navigational equipment. The compass was a tool he was completely happy and comfortable with. His first expedition was carried out merely by dead reckoning knowing his distance and bearings. And so to hold his compass and look through there and take a reading, well, it's a bit chilling, actually. And uh, it's really moving to hold that compass because you know what that meant to him. Later on, he used a more accurate means of navigation or fixing his position on the land surface, which was necessary if, if the interior of Australia was to be accurately mapped. And for that he used a sextant, and this is his sextant. It's a well-made sextant with a micrometer reading on the bottom here, and uh, it shows the commitment to accurately recording where he'd gone. His observations would, of course, been written down, and this is one of the notebooks from 1862 and it's interesting that when you read it from this direction 
the uh, observations are of two types. We have uh, lunar observations and sun observations to establish his longitude by working out the local apparent noon. And when you read it from the other direction, there are his latitude observations, all beautifully recorded here in a light copper plate script. That's very, very special. But I guess of all of the equipment that I'm looking at here, the things that have intrigued me most have been the binocular and the telescope and his spurs. I think these things are, are very interesting. These are his binoculars, they're French binoculars. They're good quality binoculars, they're still functioning today and um, they're very light. Optics were tremendously important for him in scanning the landscape, in searching for water. And the way he would look for that was to get up early in the morning and scan with a telescope. The optics are of good quality, but they're very light. Very, very light. And that's reflected also, that concept, in his spurs. Look how delicate these spurs are. That's incredible. This was a man who, in his mind, believed in travelling light and fast and his equipment very much reflects that. I've been looking at this thinking about the equipment that I take on a trip into the desert and thinking well maybe my binoculars give me better uh, vision but they're heavy compared to those. Lightness is something that as you get older I think you come to value more and more and it's something that he really understood and that's the, the abiding impression I'm left with from his, his equipment was how simple his outfit must have been how well made it was, it's robust, but it's all epitomizing his concept, light and fast. This travel light and fast approach was adopted by Stuart after a failed 18 month expedition in 1844. Captain Charles Sturt led the way. He traveled like many early explorers, taking everything that they thought they needed with them. Burdened by all their equipment and a flock of sheep, they moved very slowly. Stuart, having seen the error in the method, came up with a plan. He was convinced that you could explore this land, taking only the bare essentials and a few good men on horseback, travelling from sunup to sundown. His early trips into the then uncharted land were invaluable. Stuart taught himself what to look for, learning as he went, banking the knowledge needed to survive out here. He would use his bush girls to find a drink, going where the water led him. To the untrained eye, it would seem that finding water here would be nigh on impossible. But Stuart had the uncanny knack of wringing a drink out of this sunburnt landscape. We know that Stuart took good optics with him on his expeditions. He took binoculars, which are convenient and very easy to use, and with which he could scan ahead looking for any indication of water, maybe a particularly green or bushy tree down a creek, or wildlife, birds that could indicate the presence of water, pigeons, kangaroos. Kangaroos dig in some of these creeks for water. But the thing that really intrigues me is the fact he was carrying a telescope with him. The telescope gives you much greater magnification and we know that he would go in the morning onto high points when there was less mirage, less heat haze, take the telescope and scan the country ahead looking for any possible source of water because that's the means by which he navigated. And uh, you can picture the scene. Up. Steady the telescope. Focus it. And then very carefully follow the creek lines, studying them for anything that could indicate the presence of water. And you can very easily discern now bushes that are particularly green and verdant and with a telescope like this you can look into the bush and see the presence of bird life and having done that he could then send other members of his team out to scout ahead send them down the creek lines to survey it saying pay particular attention over there because I think that might be a good place for water and by that means he very quickly could build up an accurate impression of where the water was so that he could navigate via reliable sources of water. That's what was unique about Stuart's approach. He followed the water rather than hoping it would be where he wanted to go. 
In this vast land, Stuart couldn't have done what he did without horses. They had the stamina and reliability to travel the distances needed as he surveyed the landscape. His life literally depended upon them. To preserve the horses, Stuart set off early in the mornings, setting a steady pace as they rode for hours across the baking interior. Their needs always came first at the end of the day. No one could eat or drink until they'd been tended to. Today the mode of transport has changed to four-wheel drives, but actually the same rules apply. When you're travelling in this sort of country, you need to inspect your tyres on a regular basis. Make sure you've got the appropriate tyre pressures and look for any signs of wear. These rocks here, they're not just hard, they're also very sharp. Of course, not much has changed since McDowell Stewart came through here. Back then, it wasn't tyres, it was horseshoes. And on his second expedition, he made a major mistake. He didn't take enough horseshoes with him, and 100 kilometres north of here, he had to turn back. You can imagine, can't you? If your horse goes lame out here, you're as good as dead. The searing heat can play strange tricks on the mind and the eye. Stuart was to learn this the hard way on Captain Charles Sturt's expedition. Slowed to a standstill by all their kit, Stuart was sent to scout ahead for water, and after four days in the saddle, his weary eyes met with a very welcome sight of a huge lake in the distance. He returned with the triumphant news, but his elation would turn to disappointment, as it turned out that he had been deceived by a mirage. He vowed never to let this happen again, and wrote, the mirage is so powerful that little bushes appear like great gum trees. One would think that the whole country was underwater. One of the best ways of getting water in a desert in an emergency is by use of something called a transpiration bag. To do this, you're going to need a big polythene bag. You have to have that with you already. But here in Australia, there's a real advantage. What, what I'm going to do is going to try and trap the moisture being transpired from these leaves by covering a branch in a plastic bag. Some trees will give out chemicals called alkaloids into the water and make it toxic. But eucalypts don't do that. And that's one of the great advantages for this technique here in Australia. What I'm looking for is a, a fairly bushy branch on this sapling that's facing north, so it's going to get good sun. And I'm going to need to trim it up a little bit, get rid of some of the excess branches that I don't need. This far south in the southern hemisphere, the sun passes from east to west with the sun to the north. So that's why I'm careful to choose a north-facing branch. It really pays to take your time getting as many of the branches in as possible so that you can trap as much of the life-giving water that this bush will transpire. You have to be careful not to puncture the bag because it needs to be airtight. Seal this end as well as possible. So, I've gone to quite, quite some length to tie that firmly. I'll leave that long so that if I have to retie it later I can. Now, down at this end. So, that is the transpiration bag set up. What I've created here is a reservoir to collect the water by just narrowing the bag here. And what I'm going to do now is adjust this cord so this is hanging down at the lowest point. So I've rigged that so that this is right at the bottom, so gravity will lead any moisture down into there. That's 
good and you can already start to see moisture forming on the inside of the bag as the tree transpires it's like a greenhouse trapping all the moisture transpired from the leaves and then that finds its way down in here and of course we can shake it and tap some of the moisture so that it'll run down so we're just going to leave that now in the sun to do its work oh i've got a hole there look that's no good a bit of, a bit of gaffer tape from the crew here Leave that to do its job. As the sun climbs, the heat rises towards 40 degrees and the transpiration bag begins to work. The leaves perspire and release their precious, life giving moisture. On arriving at camp for the night, Stuart had a strict routine he adhered to. Whilst he made the most of the remaining daylight, writing up his precious charts and journal, his men would unpack the saddlebags, hobble the horses and collect wood for the campfire. Their fire lighting kit reflected Stuart's philosophy of travelling light. Rick has been given special permission to bring along the fire lighting kit of the artist Stephen King who accompanied Stuart on a number of his journeys. This was Stephen King's Fenton steel that he carried. So this is how you'd make fire, just simple gear using rudimentary equipment. It's very interesting, isn't it? A little brass tube to contain it and uh, a striker and a piece of flint and this intriguing tube. Now, I, this is the first time I've seen this. But, of course, I've seen photographs and drawings of it, Rick, and what I've done back in the UK is I've, I've gone into my shed and I've replicated this. And I'll show you what I've made. I think I've come pretty close, actually. That's, that's what I've knocked up. It's very similar. It's very close, and without actually seeing the original. But there is one thing I've added to it that I think you're going to find very interesting. What I've done is I've put in a cord. This is a cotton cord which I've impregnated with saltpetre and I think that that is what that tube on King's apparatus was used for and if I bring that charred end out and show you that yep there's a charred end but if I can get a spark to land in the right place there like that like that because this has got saltpetre it glows like a slow match and it won't go out and it won't that won't go out that's going to keep going Give this a go then, shall we, Rick? So there's our fire. Now, the clever thing about the tube is that you can pull that down and you can place your finger over the top of the tube and it starves it of oxygen and out it goes. But I think that that's what you have in this kit here. But Rick, King's fire lighting apparatus is, a, is quite well travelled, isn't it? Yeah, it's more than quite well travelled, it's extraordinarily travelled because not only did it go from south to north, the first European crossing across the continent, Dr Andy Thomas, who's a descendant of F.G. Waterhouse, who was the naturalist on the last and final expedition of Stuart's, took this as a memento when he went in the Space Shuttle Endeavour in 1996, so it's pretty well travelled. It was here, right here, right this very spot, and it was on the north coast of Australia. And then about 145 years later, it was Andy's personal memento as Australia's only astronaut on the Space Shuttle Endeavour. That's amazing. That is incredible, isn't it? To think that it was, it was probably used right here. Absolutely. Right here and then it goes off. <laughs> I find it amazing. And it's come back and it's intact. That's fantastic. Pretty special, isn't it? OK, time to see if I have enough for a life-saving drink. Well, let's have a look at the transpiration bag, and I'm really pleased with that result. In fact, the reservoir hasn't been big enough. There's a good amount of water here, and a lot more that I can tap down 
off of the branch. This is my choice of technique for an emergency here. You could have 20 or 30 of these bags stashed away in an off-road vehicle without any difficulty, should the need arise. And all you have to do is put them on the branch and let the sun do the rest. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to see how much there is in there. Normally you'd save the bag and open it carefully, but I don't have to. And I'm just going to cut it and see what the score is. Go on, go on, go on, go on. We nearly got, yes. My mug's calibrated and that's half a litre of liquid for virtually no effort whatsoever. Decent quantity, just thanks to this bush and the power of Mother Nature herself, the sun. Cheers. It even tastes good. Well, it can happen to anyone. This may look like a setup, but believe me, no one wants to get bogged down out here. However, it does give me the chance to show you how to get out of a similar situation. Having had extensive experience of traveling off-road in this country, I made sure that one of our vehicles was fitted with a winch, but we still have to dig down and place branches under the tires to give us purchase on the very soft sand bed. Would you do a your, your swag, everything's zipped in your swag, isn't it? Yeah. That guy's live cable. I've seen a winch cable break under strain before, and believe me, it's extremely dangerous. The pressure on the cable is greatest near to the vehicle that is being winched. If it snaps, it'll whip back. As a precaution, we wrap a swag around the middle to prevent this whipping action that could be lethal. The key is to be patient and to winch slowly, taking up the slack. Too fast and we will get bogged down again. Very unfortunate to get stuck there. Came down here last night in the dark, tired, a little bit dehydrated, made a poor decision. Looked down the slope and I could see where there'd been a campfire and I could also see roots of the trees. So I thought, oh, that must be hard sand. Drove down there. As soon as I got in, I realized it was soft. And I, and I bogged out on the underside of the vehicle. But uh, we're fortunate we've got one of the vehicles set up with a winch. Here's a little tip. When you're winching and you tie your shackle on, you fix your shackle on like so and you do it up a lot of people do it up really tight the problem with that is by the time you've loaded the vehicle and you've pulled it out it can have tightened and you can't get the thing undone so once you've done it up just un undo it a fraction it's still going to hold tight once there's load on there but it means when you get out you can easily undo it little tip little things like that make all the difference Reminders of the harsh reality of living in such an environment are never far away. Travelling in vehicles can lull you into a false sense of security, but step out into the blistering heat of the day and it's not long before you're reaching for the water bottle. It's hard to imagine what drove Stuart to return time and again to the desert, venturing further and further into this arid land, often not knowing where the next drink was coming from. No matter how dehydrated and exhausted from lack of sleep and nourishment, he never veered away from his task of mapping out the great swathes of uncharted land. Stuart became incredibly adept at finding water out here, but even he wasn't prepared for what he saw one evening on his second expedition. Climbing a hill, he saw stretching out before him a series of hills with water springing out of the top of them. He had discovered a line of mound springs that would become essential 
to his later expeditions. He wrote in his journal, this is another strange feature of the mysterious interior of Australia. Well, that's completely weird. I've come uphill to a waterhole. It seems like nature turned upside down. It's quite incredible. This is a mound spring. I've heard a lot about these, but it's a bit of a surprise when you come here. This was a very important place for John McDowell Stewart. This was permanent water that he could rely upon. And it was from here that he really kicked off on his proper expeditions. Amazing. It's pretty salty. But if it was good enough for John McDowell Stewart, I guess it's good enough for me too. Take the opportunity to top up the old water bag. Hard to imagine, really, what this must have been like. Riding across here on a horse would have been like crossing the lunar landscape. So to come to one of these raised points and find all this water must have been a fantastic experience, both for man and for horse. These canvas water bags are an ancient tool of Australia. In fact, I guess in some ways they're falling into disuse because people have such good refrigerators inside their off-road vehicles today. The basic principle is that the bag's wet and you tie it on the outside of your, your vehicle or on your horse or even bicycles, believe it or not. And as you, you go along, the breeze causes an evaporation on the surface that keeps the fluid cool inside. Brilliant tool. Very special place to be. Kind of get a sense of John McDowell Stewart here. Getting ready for the journey ahead. As a permanent source of water, the springs played a key role in Stuart's exploration of the interior. Mound spring expert Colin Harris is researching the springs in the area. Colin, when I first saw these mound springs, I thought nature had turned itself upside down. I mean, you walk up the slopes of this thing to find a water hole. Mm. It's bizarre. Can you tell me how that forms and how they come about? Well, the simplest description of them is that they're natural outlets for the waters of the Great Artesian Basin. So it's groundwater which is bubbling to the surface under pressure. Um, the Great Artesian Basin is a, is a huge basin. It covers about a fifth of the Australian continent. Most of the underground water in the basin has come from the Great Dividing Range um, up in northern Queensland. It's got down into water-bearing gravels and sands and sandstones, various aquifers, and it moves very, very slowly southwestwards. Um, so that the water we're seeing here um, has probably been moving through the basin at the rate of about one to three metres a year, which makes it a couple of million years old. So the water in front of us here today is really fossil water. It's, it's been around for a long, long time. Because it's moving through the aquifers so very, very slowly, it's picking up a lot of dissolved solids as it goes. So as soon as the water emerges, uh, lots of those uh, dissolved solids start precipitating out uh, and they concentrate over time and start forming these cones and the typical mound that we see behind us. So tell me about John McDowell Stewart's association with the mound springs. Yeah, well they were absolutely critical to Stewart. Without the mound springs, Stewart of his own admission would never have got across this inhospitable part of the continent. I mean, where we are today is the harshest part of the Australian continent. It's the lowest rainfall, uh, it's erratic. You'll get years sometimes with negligible rain or almost no rain at all. It was an almost insurmountable obstacle to crossing the continent, which was a great strategic objective. And Stuart, um, once he got onto the line of mound springs up here, realised that he would then be able to get unfailingly into the centre of Australia, pick up the big gum creeks, and then move into the subtropics and on through to the coast. And ultimately, of course, that's what he did in 62. Um, he comments time and again in, in his journals about the fact that without the mound springs, he would never have achieved what he did. And uh, in the annals of Australian exploration, Stuart is right there with the best of them. I mean, the thing I find fascinating is he comes into this country and there's already a technology here for finding water. There's an Aboriginal perspective. 
but he brings a new perspective on the whole issue. It's almost like, yeah, well, they do it their way, I'm going to find another way. Mm. And I have huge respect for that. It, 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 you know, I think that was really unusual. The springs were an incredible life-saving find. However, the minerals in the salty water caused Stuart and his men many stomach problems. Resourceful as ever, Stuart had an answer. This big billy can here is a water heater. It's ideal for my purposes because it has a spout. The way it works is it has this big funnel. It's a really good idea. The only way you can get water out is to put cold water in. So you put cold water in, it goes to the bottom and it forces hot water out of the side pipe. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the water to the boil and then I'm just going to keep it simmering. I don't want it bubbling and spewing salt water out through that pipe. I'm going to attach to that a pipe so that I can condense the steam and get fresh drinking water. Now, I've brought a piece of plastic hose pipe with me. I've just made a coil there. The idea is that steam will feed into this pipe. I'll have this suspended and I'm going to put a bandage around this and make that wet and the wind blowing across the bandage will cause evaporation which will cool the air inside these tubes so as the steam comes in it condenses and forms into a liquid and runs down and that should be fresh drinking water. Of course in order to use the still you have to have found water in the first place. Stuart was lucky to find such a permanent source of water in the Mound Springs. Many other explorers seeking new pastoral lands and gold and minerals weren't so lucky. There are plenty of chilling reminders of this. You know, you can never take desert travel lightly, and nowhere is that more the case than here in Australia. At the moment, I'm inside the Royal Geographical Society of South Australia. I've come here because there's an interesting collection of artefacts from expeditions of the past. Simple things like this water canteen that was found in the desert, but scratched in the outside of this tin is the last testament of William Coulthard. He scratched these words as he lay dying in the desert of dehydration. It's difficult to read now, but it says, I never reached water. I do not know how long it is since I left Scott and Brooks. But I think it Monday, bleeding Pomp, his horse, to live on his blood. I took his horse to look for water, and the last thing I can remember is pulling the saddle off him and letting him go. Until now, it is not good. Long it may weather two or three days, I do not know. I am not sure. My tongue is sticking to my mouth, and I see what I have wrote, and know, as this is the last time I may have of expressing feelings, blind. Although feeling ex you for want of water, my eyes to my tongue I can see no way I get help. This land also claimed the lives of two of Australia's best known explorers, Burke and Wills. They went head to head with Stuart when he eventually decided to employ all of his acquired knowledge to the task of crossing Australia. They were chasing fame and fortune offered to the first Europeans to cross the continent. The governments were keen to find a route for an overland telegraph linking north to south, improving trade and communications. They took a very different approach to Stuart, taking everything that they thought they needed with them. This amounted to 20 tons of equipment, 27 heavily laden camels and 23 horses. They even brought along a wooden dining table but the desert would claim their lives. Less than a year after setting off, they were down to just three men and two camels. They had practically no bushcraft knowledge and unable to process the food they found properly, Burke and Wills perished. 
Well, let's see how this has been going. It's been burning now the fire for four hours. And the difficulty with this technique is always here. It's always in the cooling. This is very, very hot, despite the, the breeze causing good evaporation. Let's have a look. Well, that's really not too bad. I told you that it was a difficult technique. It's a lot of work for your returns, but it works. You can take salty water and get drinking water from it. And there is a drink there. I mean, that's not bad going at all. As the sun goes down, this will become more efficient because the ambient temperature will drop and then we'll get proper cooling here and it'll, we'll get an even higher yield. It's a lot of work. You have to have a lot of water to get very little, but there's enough. And this is a practical means of turning saline water into drinking water. And it was a system similar to this that Stuart took with him on some of his expeditions. Stuart embraced the challenge of finding water. Once he'd found a reliable source, he would carefully plot it and then plan his future journeys around its location. True to his character, he chose to do it in his own way. He took little guidance from the Aboriginal people who had lived off the land for thousands of years. Reg Dodd, coordinator of the Arabana People's Committee, has agreed to give me an Aboriginal perspective. The Aboriginal people who were living here on the desert, part of their, their lifestyle was around the management and caring and looking after that land. Their whole survival depended on that. Their upbringing and teaching uh, gave them the skill and knowledge to survive on this land. And people would come along and say, it's, it's an arid land, there's nothing much here, what's here? But you would have knowledge and that's been handed down by generations and generations after generation, and you would know where to look for water, where to look for fine food. So uh, I'm just going to show you mm -hmm. where you can find, get water. Yeah. This is where one of our rock holes are. So it's pretty precious. So I'll just remove that and that. Then. Wow, that's amazing. That really is incredible out here. Can I taste, taste, that, taste that? You can taste that? Lovely. Wow, it's amazing. I've been tasting mound springs and mm. boreholes and things, and they're very brackish. Mm. That's very sweet. Yeah. And, and the more you clean it, the more you use it, the sweeter it gets. Isn't it? The more you use it, the sweeter it gets. So yeah. you would empty it out and you'd refill. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you mind if I fill my water bottle? You can, you can. Without Reg, I would never have known there was a water source out here, and it's so much nicer than the water Stuart and his men would have been drinking. As with so many indigenous people, it was the Aboriginals who paid the price for progress and exploration. Reg, those early explorers who came through this country, they, they didn't know where the special places were, did they? No, they would have, no, 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 not without a thing. They would have, would have been, uh, Travelling over, camping, and probably uh, venturing on places where there was, you know, a restriction of place only for men or women to go there. So they wouldn't have known that. They would have been totally ignorant. How did your people feel about that? I think in many places it, it created conflict in that because uh, uh, of the restriction of who could go on those places and, and, and uh, why. So, yeah. And in many places where you had. Uh, they would have had animals and had stock on that, and that stock would have been trampling and treading and destroying that native vegetation that provided medicine and food for for the Aboriginal people. And where we are at this moment, that's a special place. It is a very, very special place. Just behind us there now is, is a stone table, and uh, it would be thousands of years old. It's been carved out of the rock by the old people. And this area we're looking at here now is uh, actually a ceremony in place where the boys became men. Uh, a very important place to watch here. Mm. But despite the importance of this site, there's a, a railway just next to it. Exactly, yeah. And that railway corridor travels right through the heart of this very significant place for Aboriginal people. So the impact of that would be enormous. Not only was it the railway, but it was the construction of the Overland Telegraph Line, 1871. So, uh, so it would have had an enormous impact. 
obviously we're making a documentary about John McDowell Stewart, but what is your thoughts about the man? I, I often think that uh, the early explorers and, and the pioneers were actually the beginning of the end of that Aboriginal culture. In his journals, he describes an event when he's crossing the land and he meets an Aboriginal family who take him to one of these small wells that they'd, they'd dug. And he comes along with his horses and all the horses drink the water. And the Aboriginal man looks at him with astonishment. How, how do you think that man was feeling at that moment? Of course, it would have been an enormous impact because that water is so, so, so precious to him. See? So uh, the animal just coming in there and just walking in there and destroying it. And, and just, it just, uh, probably in place it would be sacrilege, you know what I mean? Creating a sacrilege. I have heard a similar story so many times on my travels and it never gets any easier or more comfortable to deal with. There's even less water in the creeks and rivers of Australia today than when Stuart crossed here. One tip for finding a drink Stuart may have been glad of in desperate times was discovered through research carried out by the Australian Army. These are one of the features of this part of the world. You get these lizards called shingleback lizards. You can see this incredible scaling on their back here. Aboriginal people would eat these for food. You can actually drink the liquid from the bladder of these creatures because they excrete most of their salts in their dung. Not a very nice idea. Much better to let this little chap walk free. But if you were walking around out here without a drink, I don't think there'd be any hesitation. There you go, fella. You wouldn't want to get bitten by one. They've got a fierce bite. They really flatten your finger. As we finished recording this piece, it began to rain, but this lasted for just five minutes. A torment for everyone who's living here under drought conditions. A powerful reminder how desperate this land is for a drink. Travelling this land, Stuart and his men spent hours in the saddle with the wind, dust and the glare of the sun taking its toll on their eyes. Stuart in particular suffered from sandy blight or trachoma caused by grit under the eyelids. It's still a problem for those living in the outback today. Sometimes it was so bad that Stuart was unable to leave the camp. On one occasion he wrote, Nearly blind, dreadful pain, can do nothing today. No sleep last night. But he never gave up and through relentless example pushed his men hard in the fierce heat of the interior. The more I see of the terrain that John McDowell Stewart crossed, the more impressed I become. It truly is one bleak savannah landscape. It's incredible. And he traversed this in the hope of finding water, confident somehow that he would. And every so often, he had that life-saving success. There's an old saying that explorers need more than just skill. They need a degree of luck and he certainly had that all-important ingredient. The final place I want to visit is a creek that became as important strategically to Stuart as the Mound Springs. It provided a reliable source of water in such an arid area. He would return to the creek many times in his explorations, allowing him to forge further north, finally using it as a jumping-off point to take on water before his crossing of the continent. Here I'm looking forward to recreating the sort of camp that Stuart would have lived in, on the very spot where he would have pitched his tent. He must have pinched himself when he came across this green, verdant valley in the middle of all this desolation. Big trees, and just like today, there's open water. This became Chambers Creek and was of huge significance in the exploration of Australia and of intense interest amongst those who wanted to run cattle in this country. Today, it's called Stewart Creek, in memory of John McDowell Stewart, and it's not easy to get to. 
In fact, even driving here in a car today, it's still a fantastic sight that raises your spirits when you see all that open water, fresh drinking water. So this is where we're to end our journey. It's quite something to know that Stuart camped here, in a tent very similar to this. It only takes a few minutes to put up. In this heat, you really want something that is light and easy, because Stuart would rarely have stayed in one place for very long. Stuart's original tent doesn't survive. We've had this one reconstructed from field sketches made on Stuart's last expedition by Stephen King. Really gives a sense of place here and it's very good shade which is welcome today. Tarps are very simple in their construction. To sit under this tarp which is very similar to the one Stuart used, I get a sense of how he would have looked out on the world while he was sitting, keeping calculations on his journeys, noting down where he'd been hypothesizing where they might next find water, instructing his men where to go. What better way to cool off than having a dip in the creek? It's too hot not to get in, I have to tell you. Oof. Stuart was very strict with his men, and rations were no different. Remember, his philosophy was to travel fast and light. They lived on a simple regime of jerked beef, tea and damper, the bread that I'm making here. It feels very special to sit here, making this staple of his diet, exactly as Stuart would have done, listening to the welcome sounds of the birds and the fresh water nearby. The creek and the surrounding country will have changed very little since he camped here. You can almost feel his presence, and it's not hard to imagine him sitting here by his fire in the fading light, meticulously recording his calculations, eating his damper and sipping on his billy tea. it a little bit too much on top. I have to say I'm more used to making this sort of bread in cold countries and the temperature is way up in the 30s so even allowing for that I haven't allowed enough. I'm just going to turn it around because the wind's blowing this way make sure it's properly cooked in the middle on that side and uh, time to get some tea on I think. I'm going to add one other special ingredient from my friend Rick. gum leaves in. Give it that unique Aussie flavour. Rick has travelled the outback many times in pursuit of Stuart's history. I started my journey with him and as I come to the end of my time here, who better to join me and share a true bushman's meal? Well, let's have some damper, Rick. It smells good. Yeah. A little bit, still a fraction doughy in the middle. Thanks. I was afraid of burning it. It's hot. It's hot, all right. Pretty tough diet, wasn't it? Very tough diet. You must have got pretty sick of it. Well, Rick, it's really special to be here in the Stuart's campsite beside Stuart Creek to eat some damper and to drink Billy tea in recognition of his achievements. Cheers. Cheers. Good health. This has been a remarkable journey, 
I had a great admiration for Stuart before I came here, and that has grown enormously. What really brings home the incredible achievement of Stuart and his men is crossing the very terrain he tackled over a century and a half ago. He learnt what he needed to survive out here, and this knowledge made it possible for him to become the first European to cross the continent and live to tell the tale. This is such a tough, unrelenting environment. It's really brought home to me how hard and determined he was. He is the one person who revealed more of Central Australia than anyone else. John McDowell Stewart never really fitted into polite society. It was out here in the wildlands that he found himself, his sense of purpose and his confidence. In a strange way, history has kind of passed him by. He's almost forgotten. But not to those people who still live and travel here in the bush. To them, this Scotsman of diminutive stature is remembered as a giant of exploration. Thank you.